Hello guys, sorry about that. Uh, major PC malfunction there. Computer just didn't like Sean in the end, so it cut him off for a while. I'm not surprised, he was getting on my nerves anyway. For the short period he was trying to get a connection. But here we're back on again. Hopefully Sean will be joining us in just a second. If we can get him back on, so with a little bit of luck, here we go. Sean, how you doing? Are we on? We're on. We're live. Fantastic. All I had to do was switch the damn thing on and off again. <laughs> there was, I, was, I, was, I was blaming you because... Like, if, only that worked, if only that worked week. with people. You know? if, only, if only we could switch people off and on again. I don't understand what's going on here. I mean, look, you've been pestering me for weeks and to come on here and give me a hard time, you know, ringing me up in the middle of the night and... When am I on? When am I on? You know, when am I coming on? You know, I mean, I, you know, listen, I know you're up there. You're up there. You know, you're at the top, but it doesn't mean to say you're any better than anybody else, you know? Well, so I've just been going out of my mind in lockdown. That's all it is. Yeah, I've got nothing else to do. Nothing else to do but pester you. Well, why did you wake me up at two o'clock in the morning? You know? Anyway. I mean, who's but, asleep? But, no one sleeps. It doesn't no matter. one sleeps at night anymore. Matter. Okay. If, you've got, if you feel the need to talk and you want to talk to me, that's okay. That's all right. It's not a problem. It's all right. Anyway, look, it's good to have you here, mate. Great to be with you. I'll tell you what, I'm glad. I, I was getting worried about my technology problems here. You know, I'm, I, I thought I was well. I've got a studio here. I've got a new computer, TV. You know, unfortunately, I've just got you. You know, but that's all right. It's okay. Anyway, look, we're not, we're not going to worry about that, okay? It's good to have you on. Lots to talk about. We've got questions Brilliant. here. You know, I'm going to try, guys, I'm going to try and keep this short and sweet because Sean's got a couple of young kids and, you know, you know, he's driving the mod. You know, but that's okay. You know, he's, he's coming on for a little while to talk about himself, but that's all right. Right, look, Sean. <laughs> look, listen. I've had a little look at your career, okay? And I've had a look at you. The first thing I look at when I look at a player who's at the top end, and you are at the top end, I mean, you know. You're not very exciting, but you're up there, you know. And I look at your timeline, and I have a look at your timeline, you know, and you turned professional at the age of 15. Yeah. And, you know, okay, like like a lot of players who have reached the top, it took you a wee bit of time to get flowing. You sort of, uh, you came in, 98, and it took you about six years maybe to get rolling. But when you did... Even six, even at the age of 21, you found yourself in the top 16, and you've pretty much been, in, been there ever since. Now, a lot of the boys I've been speaking to over the last few weeks, you know, have taken them like a decade to, to maybe even just get in the top 32 and then come out again. But you've obviously came to the top, you know. But, you know, you pretty much got in there straight away and got straight in. And that's why you are where you are. Uh, you wouldn't have got there if you hadn't if you had hadn't had the had the ability to do that. But the other interesting thing about you is very interesting to players like Alex Higgins and other players. Where you, you know, two thousand and five, you know, World Championships final, two thousand and nine finalist again, two thousand and fifteen finalist. But you won the title in 2005. It was so young. Were you overwhelmed? Were you, were you shocked? Or what happened? Tell us all about that. Yeah, I think, I think going back to your point a minute ago about, you know, I got into the top 16 early in my career was just because of the World Championships. You know, you got so many points back then. And, of course, the rankings were only done once a season. Um I kind of did it backwards. You know, you're really supposed to get on the tour, establish yourself, maybe win a ranking event here or there, then get to the latter stages in some majors, lift something else. And then maybe, you know, a few years down the line, as a favourite, win something like the World Championships. Um, all my friends would tell you that that's not, su not a surprise that I didn't follow that uh, protocol and um, went about it in a completely different way. It, I, it was, you know, completely unexpected. I've told the story a few times how I'd actually, I'd actually given up snooker really um, a few weeks prior to winning the championships in 05. I just said, that's me done. That's me done with it. I'd had enough with it. 
Um, my career was going nowhere. I was ranked, you know, mid-table, not climbing the rankings at all. Uh, I had a really bad beat in the qualifiers for the China Open. I had my opponent, you know, snookered with three reds left. He, 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 flew, to, he flew to red out the snooker and dished. And that was sent me out. And I said to my coach back then, who who's no longer with us, Steve Prest, um, we were driving home in the car. I said, that's me done. Why would you want to say you're done? You're only a wee nipper. For goodness sake, you only just got yourself into the game. You turned pro at 15. How old were yeah. you? You were going to give up, what, six, six, 17, 18? What? How old this were you? Was, I mean, this was in 05. So, I mean, this was in sort of February, March 05. I just had no money left. You know, we didn't have really much money as a family. Um, I certainly had no money to speak of. Uh, and um, I, I just sort of lost any enthusiasm for it, belief. And, and obviously there were economic pressures as well. You know, I, I was starting to look at reality and go, well, this dream that I've chased from being a child. You know, I left school when I was 13. Uh, my family sacrificed a lot financially and you know, in a lot of other ways, um, you, you know, it's time to face up to the reality that it just hasn't worked and I'll have to go and get a job. We tried our best. Um, I'd won the Benson and Hedges Championship at that stage and got to play at Wembley as a wild card. You know, it hadn't been without its, uh, you know, high points to that to that point, but um, it was time to face reality. Uh, and I, I went and asked for a job at the local uh, Mercedes garage in Sheffield. And the guy was like, well, um, you know, when are you available to start? And this, that and the other. And I told him and he said, well, go ahead and, you know, finish the season. Why do you know, finish, finish your season and mm -hmm. then come back and, you know, we'll talk. And um, I, en I ended up entering, I'm sorry, I ended up playing in the world championships that year purely because I'd already paid my entry fee. That was the only reason I played in it. Um, £750, as it was back then, to enter the championships was a lot of money to me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have that kind of money to waste. So I played in it out of respect for the money, really, that I'd already spent. And, um, and because I'd kind of now got my eye, one eye on going off and doing something else, that had probably taken a big weight off and I went to the qualifiers and played Marcus Campbell and Joe Swale and really played well. But I still obviously went to the Crucible. Not, you know, I didn't know, didn't know my way around the building, let alone how to play out there in the arena, you know. And um, I'd never won a match there before. I'd been there twice before. I lost on my debut to Hendry, got absolutely slaughtered. Um, I lost the following year in 03 on a black ball decider to Ken which was devastating, didn't qualify in 04. And then in 05, obviously, I play, I went, everyone knows what happened. But um, to skip forward a few steps, that then obviously gave me so many ranking points um, that I jumped above quite a lot of players. I think I was ranked 48th at the time when I won. Right. Um, and actually winning the championships took me to 21st in the rankings but by a weird twist of how our system works i was then installed as number two seed at every tournament <laughs> and any new events i was number one seed and i think i think in terms of rankings um you know ian mcculloch suffered very badly because of that because he was ranked 16th and i think that i think that type of thing happened to him well certainly that year and maybe the following year um and it's obviously no fault of any players. That was how the system was conducted then. The rankings were, you know, they were they were ridiculous back then, really. Um, but that was the system we played under. And um, I think if I'd followed the more traditional path of ranking event, do quite well, build your career up, you know, win the Masters or so, and then win the Worlds, my progression through the rankings would have been more traditional. But... Yeah just sort of jumped straight in there at the last moment. As I say, uh, my career was finished. I, I, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd happily accepted that my life as a snooker player, that I tried my best to give in everything I possibly could, slept in the car, horrible B&Bs. You know, it was horrific. And anyone watching, you know, who's, who's had a go um, will know what I'm talking about. You know, it was some horrific nights in, you know, the car, sleeping in side streets in Blackpool, 
you know, all the different qualifying events, uh, just chasing that dream. And I'd, I'd kind of accepted that it just hadn't worked. And I think that, I think that kind of, well, you know, it didn't work. We tried our best. I think that, um, oh, hello. Hello. Well, that's, that's that? Dave, I'll just ignore it. She's off for dinner. Why do you have to torture me? Oh, I'm speaking to Sean here. Come on, get off the screen. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll sooner take kids any day, Sean. I really would. Yeah. Yeah. I've got Lady Camille. <laughs> okay. But anyway, look, look, the thing is with that, that, I'll tell you what, by the way, Sean, that's an amazing story. That's an incredible story because that's, and I'm glad you, you brought it up, that because I, I, it's not something I would have thought about talking about because. Uh, I remember an interview you did in the past that reflected on that, you know, it's, it's over. Yeah. It's over, you know. That's it. Yeah. Get out. And, uh, <laughs> and it's incredible. So you go to the World Championship and you win it. You know, you're 22 years old. You know, yeah. from there on in, pretty much there on in, you stay in the top 16. You know, I know you... I know you dropped down there a bit in the rankings just last season, but yeah. I mean, all honestly, you had a few issues going on at home, and you know, uh, but you, you soon turned that around. Just before this, just before this pandemic started, you actually turned that around, got back on, so you proved the player that you are. But that is a fascinating story, mate, and I hope the guys who are uh, who are at home actually listen to this. Never give up. Just don't give up. Would you say that's a case that maybe a lot of players, perhaps particularly young players, give up too soon? What do you think? I think there's a lot of players who, who, who um, you know, in snooker, in all sports, I can obviously only speak about snooker, but they never actually get to the bottom of their barrel. They, they never reach their lowest point. They think they do. Mm. Um, and, you know, I... Uh, Friends of mine and people who influenced me when I was, a, you know, a kid used to say things like, "Well, you know, if you want the if you want the successes, you've got to be willing to pay the price," uh -huh. and that and that price, you know, presents itself in many different forms. And uh -huh. as I say, for me, I suppose it was, you know, it wasn't just a monetary price, which was very costly and, and still is very costly. The expenses of being a, a full time professional sports person are significant, as you can imagine, but. Uh -huh. um, I suppose, really, if we can park the financial element of it for a minute, um, which is it's very hard to you know de detangle, detach the two, but um, the mental, the mental challenge and the emotional challenge um, was equally as difficult. And then, of course, it's not just you going through that; your loved ones are going through it. Everyone who's helped you along the way is going through it, um, and uh, it's. You know, it's a damn good thing it worked out. <laughs> it did work out. Obviously, it did work. Out, looking back, so you know, four years later, you got the final again. Yeah. How did it feel then? Yeah, it felt completely differently that year because I was obviously an established player. I'd been to the final before. You know, it has to be said in '05 uh, when I walked out in the one table setup for the semis and the final. You know, I just couldn't breathe. Um, even having played at the Masters in the old Wembley Conference Centre, I just couldn't breathe. So I did well to 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 to, to win in 05, bearing in mind like before the final in 05, they brought out all the past champions. They all came out for a procession and you're thinking, geez, like, you know, they're watching backstage, I've just missed this black off the spot and you know, all this. And um so when it came to 09, like I'd sort of dropped that and I'd won a few other tournaments and you know, that wasn't new anymore. Um, but I just ran into Higgins, who I think we were level pegging after the first session. I think we were four frames each after the first session. And then I lost the second session on the Sunday night, I think 7-1, something like that. And he that just broke the back of the match. And my that's where it was really exposed to me as a just as a person that my B game, my C game, was just nowhere near. And if I'm honest, it's taken me a long, long time to accept that, but then also go ahead and make changes and try and improve that. I ran into Higgins and I think I was playing the best snooker of that fortnight um, in terms of pure break building and scoring and consistency. 
But I ran into Higgins, who went into it, I think, with the game plan of tying me up. And he knew that his defensive game was way better than mine. Mm. And he was right. And he, you know, he broke the back of the match in the second session. And I was just, I was never in the game after that. Never in the game. It's funny you touched on that thing, Higgins. You know, I think Higgins and Selby and many great players, probably just like yourself or thinkers, but do you think that that's something that they're aware of? The players know they're very conscious of the fact that they're aware that you're under pressure and they've got you because maybe their safety game and their match play is a a lot stronger than yours. Are are, are players at your level aware of that? Uh, Well, I think there's a there's a bit of a there's a bit of a or there's almost a bit of a lie sold in snooker. And that is to just play the balls. Just go out and play the table. Forget who you're playing. Just right. go out and play the table. Play the balls. Doesn't matter. And I think I think that's true to a certain extent. But then I think the very best players in the world, the legends, the ones we all talk about, they, in my opinion, they do play the player. And they do work out your strengths and weaknesses and tailor their game to it. They don't play the same against everybody. And I think if you, if you watch, I remember Ray Reardon saying to me that when he, his biggest rival in the seventies was Spencer. And he used to say to me, when I played Spencer in exhibition matches, I never played the same against him as I would in a tournament because I didn't want him to see my real game. I didn't want him to see my moves. Sean, I, I'm not. I mean, could you do that? I mean, do you ban any of that? I'm not. I mean, I mean, yeah. No, I have to say, I, I do because I, I, I've watched a lot of snooker, you know, as we all have, and I, I think the real top players. I'm talking about the class of '92s, the Davises, the Hendries. Maybe not so much Hendry because he just went, he just went for your throat from frame one. Didn't matter who you were, but I think uh, a lot of those players did try and work you out. They did They did know you were good in that area, so we'll keep him up there. We won't do... And then against somebody else, they might open their shoulders a bit more and go for a few shots and, you know, just try and intimidate somebody. Whereas with other players, they would know they've got to have their guard up a little bit more and play in a slightly more considered way. And I, I really do think that, that it's very easy to say, just go out and play the player. Sorry, just go out and play the table. Don't get involved. Just play the balls. Mm. I'm not too sure that the real best players on the, on the planet now we're talking about actually do that. I think they might sneakily uh, on the quiet. I think they might be doing something else. Interesting, very interesting stuff. And then we'll just just to extend. But I have it. been I have been known to be wrong before, so I, I'm I'm happy to accept that. <laughs> I, yeah, I haven't met a snooker player who's right yet, Sean, okay? So, yeah. <laughs> 2015, you did it again. You know, here we are, 2005, 22 years old, wins a world championship. Ten years later, third final, third final, okay? Alex Higgins did it, 72 and 82. Nice little reflection there, by the way, because I know you respect them on. I know you. I know you do, and I remember the very nice words you said at his funeral. By the way, I couldn't be there. I was getting beaten up by a bunch of thugs up in Glasgow, but that day I wanted to get to the third. I wanted to get to the funeral, but lovely words you said. Really, really nice words. So let's go back to 2015. Well, I think until this season that's just sort of been suspended at the moment. 2000, you know, 14, 15 was, was, I think, my best season on record. You know, around that time, I was playing some great snooker. Chris Henry and I were working very, very hard, you know, daily. Um, if not together, then remotely, digitally and stuff like that. We were, we were making some... I think that season or that year, I think I had three 147s in one calendar year. Um, my game was in, was in really good nick. And... I think in the January of 15, I'd won the Masters um, and played some of the best snooker of my life. Mm. Um, got to the final the following week of the German Masters and really was peaking at the World Championships. And mm. like, I mean, I look back at some of the matches I played in that tournament and just think, well, you know, I just went for too many again. And But they they went in. 
in that fortnight. They all went in and I scored heavily. I played with confidence uh, and found myself, you know, in the final. And I look back at that match and just think, well, we played 33 frames in that match, Stuart and I. And I think there was 30 breaks over 50 or 60 in 33 frames. So there was 30 breaks of over 50 or 60 in 33 frames. The standard of play was incredible. I mean, to be part of it was incredible. But there was a there was a commentator who I'll have to remain nameless. He came up to me after the match at the after party, where obviously everyone on my team was a little bit downhearted, um, as you would be, having just lost the world final. He said to me that really, you know, if you just played one or two more safety shots in that match, you might have won that game. And I suppose that speaks to what I was talking about from the start, which is it's taken me so long to learn and accept that side of the game. I was brought up literally to look at these shots and think, well, if you think you can get it, go for it. Mm. Because you might not get another chance. That was how I was raised. Um, And it's been very hard for me to unravel that, to to reteach myself a different way of playing. Um, and it's something I'm still working on, you know, I'm still trying. Very, um, very, good very, very good But point. I didn't I didn't have it. And I, I certainly would take nothing away from Stuart because I mean he beat Robbie Williams in the first round, Graham Dot in the second round, O'Sullivan in the quarters, Judd in the semis, and myself in the final. The players uh-huh. he beat on the way to winning that tournament, like it, he fully, fully deserved it. And the way he played in the final was just fabulous. Um, I thought the way I remember sitting in my chair in the what turned out to be the last two frames, which he won with uh, two one visits. And I remember sitting there thinking he's bound to realise at some point he's bound to realise what he's doing here. It, it, you know, the pressure of what he's achieved. And it didn't. It certainly didn't seem to. And he made a frame-winning break to to get on the hill, as we say. And then in the last frame, I went for another long red, which I missed, left him in the balls. And he made he, he won the championship in one visit. And I mean, like to stand there and do that is, yes. is fabulous. So I could never take anything away from him at all. Look, Stuart did very well. He deserved it, as you said. And he's a great player. He's a great player. Every time I speak to Stuart, he keeps reminding me of that. You know... How good he is. But that's all right. You know, I mean, it, by the way, he was the first one on here. But, yeah, he did He did reflect on that world final against you. And he holds mm. you in high regard. You know, doesn't think he, you know, didn't slag you off too much. I don't think he did. You've got to watch that interview, actually. You, you've yet to watch the Stuart Bingham one, haven't you? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> right, we're going to get on to some questions shortly. But I like to sort of, like, delve into you a bit. And uh, okay. I, th- I think... The thing that fascinates me about snooker players, um, particularly the players that interest me, you know, I, I keep telling people, Sean, and I, I get a little bit bored, you know, watching snooker. I, I, I like an attacking player. I like a player that goes for it. And you're one of those players. You're one of the very few, few players at the top that that attacks, and you, you, you sort of reflected on changing your game there slightly. About five minutes ago, it's, it's, I'm not sure it's something that a top player can do. You know, in a, in a lot of respects, I think it would it would be very very difficult for a top player to change his game. But in that in that, I'm gonna say that re- reflecting on yourself, I mean, like you know, change, maybe not taking so many shots on or not being so attacking. You know, you're a very strong player. You're quite entertaining to watch, actually. Unlike Stuart and Davis, I mean, they they bore. You know, I'm not even going to go there with Fergal O'Brien. You know, every time I watch Fergal O'Brien play, I feel like throwing darts at the TV screen. You know what I mean? But, you know, that's okay. So a little bit of exciting, you know. Maybe you don't quite have the youth of Trump, you know, or you haven't got the crowd following up Ronnie. But you have everything else. You're very tactical. You're very mindful as well, you know, and you like to talk about the game, which is a good thing too. And that puts me on to one of – I like to tie the questions in with this because I, I'm – this is tough. See, reading questions and talking to you is like a – such a such a difficult thing to do, you know. So things like your cue action, mm. I've got a great cue action. 
I call you the master human because you you, you do you. Uh, I mean, Not to my face, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> but you get down there. You get down there with precision. You know, there's very little movement, total focus, and you could say that about the rest of you. I mean, look, I look at a lot of top top end professional players, and you know, you seem to have the demeanor, you know, the the the, the temperament, you know, the composure, and you can you can actually, you know, your your temperament is so good, you can probably reconstruct yourself very well when you're under pressure in a match. And I haven't said that you are the pop and you're good. When you're good, you're good. You're very good. But there's days when you're bad and you're awful. And that's yeah, yeah. the thing to play to say about other players. So let's just touch on that for a second. Top players play well, tough to beat, and everybody knows, very intimidating, what have you. But the days when they're really crap, it's not all about why. No. Hey, you just use the key word, and it's composure. And if you lose your composure out there, you lose everything. Um, if you lose your cool, lose your calm, um, they're all C words. Uh, if you lose them, you, you know, you literally can't think straight. Um, and if you, you know, your emotional state controls how you make decisions and what decisions you make, how you, how you feel changes the way you think. And, you know, that leads to, I'm not going to go all Yoda on everybody, but that is, you know, that's, it's the, the line, you know, how you feel leads to how you make decisions and that changes what comes out the other end. So I think you watch the, the very best. I mean, during lockdown, I've been watching so much YouTube footage from the old days, uh, you know, the 70s. And you watch somebody like a Reardon, just never broke sweat, never looked out of his depth, obviously got beaten from time. You know, he did lose. He wasn't unbeatable. No one is. But you just never got in his bubble. You, no one ever got under his skin. If he lost, it was because he played some bad shots, which we all do. But he never lost his composure. And that's the biggest, biggest asset of any player. Because everyone can pop balls. Mm -hmm. Everyone can engulf. Everyone can make birdies and hit it 300 yards these days. But can they do it on the Sunday afternoon coming down the stretch? Can they stand there? and pop those balls and win that frame now, when it matters now. Mm. And there's not many that can. And it, and it is that, that composure, that ability to literally, you know, these simple cliches of take a deep breath and make good, clear decisions now. That's the difference between the people who lift the trophies and people who don't. So is that is that now we, we focused on those things like composure, temperament, composure, you emphasize composure. Is that is, is, is that put you is that the reason why you are where you are? Is that put you where you are? I, well, I think you you know that for me that is the foundation. If you think in terms of building a skyscraper, the composure element has to be at the bottom of it. You have to be able to think clearly under pressure keep your emotions in check and make good decisions that, you know, and people refer to it, people refer to it with different bottle and all of these things gets thrown around. What it really is, is composure, being able to think clearly under pressure. It's not the only element. It's of course, it's not the only, you know, reason or, 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 uh, you know, puzzle. It's not the only piece to the puzzle, but it is the most important in my opinion. And, and followed, again, purely on, in my opinion, following that very closely mm. is a good technique that stands up under pressure. And I, I remember saying this to somebody after an exhibition that I played for them. And, and uh, this guy was giving me a hard time at this exhibition for, you know, some match I'd lost or some balls I'd missed. And he'd, he'd had a bet on this match. And he was giving me a hard time that I'd lost the game and, you know, he'd lost his accumulator on me or whatever it was. And I just said to him, well, you know, I think one of the things you guys sometimes forget is that those nerves and, and being out there and performing and wanting to win, sometimes you just get a bit nervous. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes in these big games, you see players close up, they shake. 
some players are so they, they physically shake. Were you late it's not you started off. You came in. I mean, obviously, the turning pro at fifteen. There's not many players turning professional at fifteen. Showing who reached the top. You know, were you nervous then? Were you shaking then? No I I remember my first professional match was at the Plymouth Pavilions in 1998, and I walked out to play the qualifiers against Dermot McGlinchey, who was a wonderful player uh, and a really nice man. Uh, from the Republic of Ireland That's right. and real nice guy. And I remember walking out there and I just felt sick. I wanted to go. And I, I remember I, at the interval, I came out and I was losing 3-1 and my dad was there and he was like, how do you feel? How do you, are you enjoying it? And I said, I want to go home. Don't like it. <laughs> right, okay. Don't okay. like it. All right. uh, and, you know, at that stage I'd played in the, the, the Doc Martins had sponsored me at that stage and they yeah. they had the Premier League. So I'd done those exhibition frames, which they were quite well known at the time. So I'd done that. I was used to playing in front of crowds and all that type of thing. But I remember going out there, I just felt physically sick. Mm-hmm. And and coming full circle now, I, you know, dealing with those pressures of, of, of whether it, you want to win so badly or you want to perform well or just being nervous because you want to win and the other guy's good as well. Like all of those things can have an effect, mm-hmm. and that's when having a sound, solid technique um, that can operate automatically without you having to think about it. Um, you know, not thinking right which finger comes off the grip here when I take it back, and how do they reconnect, and is my cue on my chest, and how's my bridge, and you know, without having to think about that, really takes the pressure off. And I remember Colin Montgomery, a golfer. He said um, his his career started to go on the downer when he started playing golf, trying to work out how to play golf. And I think if you if you're out there in the arena trying to find your action, trying to trying to work on your game whilst you're trying to win a snooker match, then you're on a very slippery slope. Golf's a great sport. A lot of good snooker players golf. I know you've got a low, a low handicap. I've been trying to play, play golf for 30 years. Uh, the guys, you know, well, I, was, I stopped playing a couple of years ago. But the, guy, well, I'm the young guys I was playing with, they're all five, four, five handicappers. They were just laughing at me, Sean. They were laughing at me. I mean, I could smack a ball 300 yards, but they were hitting the ball 320, 340, you know, with uh, 300 pound drivers, you know? <laughs> <laughs> at least I made them laugh, you know. But oh, yeah. I have to stop it. I have to stop it. But it's a great sport. But I know I'm just going to touch on golf for a second because I know I'm not not sure, Sean. Just remind me, your father was your father a was he a professional? Maybe I've got this wrong. Your father wasn't a professional golfer, was he? He, no. he was a professional golfer. Yeah, in, in his early life. Yeah, he was for a, you know a year or two. He would have been a. A professional attached to a club in Manchester, yeah. And you were, uh, you're, you've always been, uh, as far as I know, I haven't talked to you about this before, but you're a pretty professional golfer. What's your handicap at the moment? Uh, at the moment, it's uh, scratch. Uh, I got to scratch two years ago, um, two or three years ago. This is one. Uh, of, this is one of the. Sorry. Questions. Oh this right, is, okay, right, right, right. yeah. Um, no, uh, no, I'm going to let you extend on that. I, I keep interrupting the guys. You know, I'll talk as much as you do. One of the questions was, would golf have been perhaps a professional sport for you? Uh, no, I don't think so. It, it never, it never, um, I, I never got to the point where I had to choose between snooker or golf. It was always snooker for me. Um, mm. uh, you know, I'm not good in the sun. I don't tan well. So it was a, it was a, it was the right choice. Yeah. I think most snooker players, you know, not, not many of us are good in the sun. We're all used to dark, shady, dark, shady snooker rooms, and yeah, you know, you you look like you've got a similar um, blood pressure look look to me, blood pressure, right? And uh, uh, moving on, and um, yeah, I was never in that time where snooker and my, you know, the golf really uh, questioned it. I, I, I did after I was given a good talking to. Uh, by a few people, I think, um, you know, I'd got my car, I was 18 or 90, I was driving, I was independent, and I was playing a lot of golf with my mates, you know, I had no commitments, um, I had a sponsored car with my name down the side, you know, what an idiot, and, uh, 
You know, we were just like, we were meeting at the snooker club and then saying, right, let's go for a game of golf. You know, stick this. This is like, let's go. Like the sun's shining. Of course, my snooker career started to nosedive. <laughs> my golf handicap started to go like this. You know, I started to get better at the golf. And I started, I was playing 36, 50, four holes in a day and, and doing an hour's snooker practice, if even, you know, maybe three or four times a week and wondering why I wasn't getting any results. Like, you know, so there was a time where I needed that. I needed that talking to off a few people to say, listen, are you, uh, are you being a snooker player or, or are you being a golfer? You know, like which, which one are you doing here? Um, so, you know, there was that. Um, but no, I, I think, uh, um, I think I definitely made the right choice without question. And so before we go on to some of the questions here, try and complain some of them as well. We're looking back over your whole career, Obviously, you came in really, really young. Um, as I say, you've been, you've, you've been at the top for years. It's very tough to do. Where do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself now in the game? Where do you uh, see well, I, I, suppose, I suppose really, like, I mean, as I say, the, the season we were in the middle of, mm-hmm. um, I say in the middle of, we had two events left. Um, that That is and has been and was my best season on record. Mm-hmm. Um, whilst I've not picked up a major, um, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I've never played a season and won, and won two ranking events in the same year. Um, mm-hmm. But my, I think my level of play this season has been very high. Um, and, you know, I've been very, very happy with where my game's been been going. I've been working very hard again with Chris Henry. Um, mm-hmm. and, I've, and I've, you know, mentioned Fergal a number of times. He's absolutely sick of it. Um, and I, you know, I, but I, but I've been I've been working very very hard, um, and I have to say I I think I'm actually now sat here now talking to you now, you know, is the best I've ever been as a snooker player. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a better player now than I was in fifteen, in nine, and in two thousand and five, um, okay. where I obviously got to the final of the greatest championship of them all. Um, does that mean you're going to win more torn? No, because <laughs> everyone else is really good as well, and everyone else has improved. I mean, just in my, just in my, um, I mean, I, 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 how many years has I've, have I been on tour now? You know, twenty, twenty-one years of on tour, something like that. Right. Um, the standard on the tour, from the top to the bottom, is just now. It's just the best it's ever been. Um, this argument rages about like you know, the top the top ten are they as good now as they were ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty? Mm-hmm. Who cares? Like you know, it's an it's an argument you're never going to settle. You're never going to know um, would Steve Davis have be have lived in the top sixteen today? And like you know, you're just never going to know that. Um, but the standard on tour from number one to one two eight, and the guys that are coming through Challenge Tour, and the guys that come through Q School. Like is seriously, seriously good, and it's you know it's just a it's a great time to be a snooker player. It's a great time to be on tour and and have these opportunities. Certainly more money anyway in that, in that respect. You know, you touched on Steve Davis. There, Steve Davis has complimented you in the past. I don't know why. <laughs> no, actually, I do pay. You, I pay him quite pay well. Him. Though. I pay him well. I'm going to agree with Steve on one thing. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with Steve Davis in a sense that uh, you've probably got the best tree action. Now Steve has said Steve Davis has said this. You know, he has said this. Um you do you do actually have one of the best tree axes actions, you know. Ronnie Ronnie's got a great tree action. Sometimes it's a little erotic. Sometimes you're gonna lose it a little bit, but your your Q action is would you not say yourself a strong point? Long ball pattern. Cue ball control. Oh, believe me, it's up. It's right up there. It's right up there. Yeah. Yeah. Is that your strong? I think, um, I think it depends. I think it's it's always an interesting one, and, and I would never. I'm certainly not going to give myself accolades. It's you know, it's very generous of you to say, but I, I, I think you know what, when people say you've got a great cue action or what you know, I'm not. I'm never really sure what that means. I've never really really been a hundred percent sure what the Q act you know what they mean by that. Cause really, really all the Q action is 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 trying to return the cue 
to your address position at the cue ball and hit the cue ball where you meant to. That's right. That's, that's actually, really all it is. And, 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 and that's, it's actually something that, you know, I've been working very hard on the last couple of seasons because a little technical fault had come into my game where I, I was, you know, addressing the cue ball in the right place. I was sighting the ball properly, I was making those good decisions we were talking about. But then at the very last moment, every now and again, I wasn't hitting the cue ball mm. where I meant to. Right. And so the cue ball wasn't going in the direction I wanted it to, wasn't hitting the object ball in, in the correct position. And I was either missing the pot or the ball was going in the wrong part of the pocket. And then the white isn't going in the right place. So your cue ball control isn't as good or your safety play isn't as good because you hit the object ball slightly too thin or slightly too thick just because at impact, you didn't hit that cue ball exactly where you meant to. And and that's something that Chris, again, you know, for a name check to Chris, that's something that we've worked incredibly hard on over the last season, maybe two seasons, to just improve that, improve that consistency of hit that ball where you mean to. And it sounds so simple and it is so simple. But obviously, if you don't hit it correctly, it can go anywhere and anything could happen. And um, people say to me, they say, no, what, what are you working on now? And it's literally that. You know, that is it. When I choose to hit the white there, can I hit it exactly there? I think you've just answered the question there, Sean. To be honest with you, for me, Q action, good Q action is, is pretty much the, going right back to the very good case of what it is, which is, you know, repeating repeating the shot it's repetition yeah. it's, it's you know if you're queuing if you're queuing really well then you, you know there's very little movement there's complete focus and focus restricted movement repetition i think that that in essence is 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 a is a, is a superb queue action i mean ronnie has that I mean, you, you 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 might look at ronnie and ronnie can whatever whatever the hell's going on that ron's head nobody can ever work him out anyway I mean, when he's walking around the table and he's playing a shot, but he's actually what he's doing. You know, he's a, he's a machine. You know, he, he his good action is, is is superb. It is, and, and very good. You can, you can have a look at your own, and you know, I look at your your good action, and I see uh, I see a, I see a player who's very focused and very composed, and, and who is probably getting as close to hitting the ball precisely exactly where he wants to hit it. And I think for me, that, that's the fundamentals of a good cue action. So that, that's my, and I think you've just, I'm just repeating what you just said, actually. I feel like one of those politicians, you know, uh, yeah. with the pandemic. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about Henry. The coach Henry. Uh, you keep mentioning his name. And that was one yeah. of the next things I was going to talk about the coaching. Coaching has had a great effect on you, on Hendry. Touch on that, Hendry. Q action. How much has he helped you? Has he like really helped you, or? Well, I think the great thing with Chris is, um, it, you know, as far as as far as we call it, cue ball mechanics in as terms of, uh, you know, how 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 it actually works when you hit the ball you know, there and it goes over that how it all works together, in my opinion, he is he is the man. And it's great to be able to look at a shot and go, right, uh, we tried to do X, uh, actually we got Y. Um, how and why did that happen? And it, it's great to be able to have those conversations um, with somebody who, and this is why for me, he's such a great coach is because he's played the game to a very high level. Um, he has walked out there and played in front of the TV cameras himself. Um, as I say, he played to an extremely high level, knows what it's like out there and understands the technique of the game as well, if not better than anyone else. So mm -hmm. it's great to be able to have those conversations. And of course, um, w when you do delve into it with someone as knowledgeable as Chris, you can only come out of it better. Um, and he really has. Uh, you know, he's been my he's been my twelfth man, really. He's been the he's been you know he's he's been my corner man for a long, long time, 
and you know will be will be going forward. Very good. And let's just touch on site rate for a wee second here. Okay. Yeah. Um, what has that done for you? Is that some something you believe in, and how has it helped you? Well, site right, um, you know, revolutionised my game. Uh, I, I didn't know, like many, you know, I, I commented on site right. Uh, before I actually knew what it was, um, you know, there was quite a lot of criticism thrown around uh, about it. People being sceptical about it. Um, I think people thought that it was a bit gimmicky. Uh, mm. Yep. And I, I've always been, I've always prided myself on being somebody that if I'm going to say something to you about something, I want to know about it first. If I'm going to promote something, I need to understand it and it has to work. If I'm going to put my name to it and my reputation on the line for for a product or a person or whoever it might be, it has to be right. So I called Steve Feeney. I said, can we have a session? I'd love to know how SiteRight works. I'd like to know if it can help me. Um, I've got a few issues in my game and I want to understand how it works. He said, not a problem. We arranged the session and uh, within within a minute, on the table, we had a bit of a chat. We you know, had a coffee and a bit of a chat. Then we got on the table, and within a minute, it changed my game forever. And it uh, and it is, in terms of on table play, in terms of on table coaching, uh, it's just been a game changer for me. Can you and be I, a I, specific about what it was when you were when you were on the table with Fadi? Can you touch on just for the guys at home, the amateurs? Yeah. You know? Is there anything specific you could just touch on there? Like a your table well, shot I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of people out there don't really understand what sight right is. They think it's maybe a different way of hitting the ball or a different action or standing yeah. in a different place. Mm. Sight right is this in a nutshell. When you're stood at the address position, when you are deciding how to play the shot in front of you, when you are sighting the ball, mm. how do you know whether you're stood in the right place? That's it. Mm -hmm. So you could have the best eyes, the best action, the best shot selection. But at the point where you chose where to aim the ball, you were stood in the wrong place for mm -hmm. your own for your own vision specifics. Because everyone's eyes are different. Everyone's eyes work in a different way. What I think is straight, you would think was slightly off and vice versa. And the sight right tech is all about that. Now, obviously, I, I cannot, um, you know, go into full detail about it. it would be would be remiss of me. But 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 in terms of what it is in a in a nutshell, mm -hmm. how do you know as the player at that moment where you make your decisions on where you're going to strike that ball for your own vision requirements? How do you know? That you're stood in the correct position. And for me, it's been it's been vital. And if I could just finish my point, we're all we are all taught. I was taught. You were probably taught. Everyone out there was taught to sight the ball with their cue on the line of the of the shot to the for a right-handed player with the butt of the cue on their right hip, and you almost lean over like that when you're when you're sighting the ball. We were all taught to do that because Joe Davis when he wrote the first snooker manual in 1945 or whenever it was, the, the Bible, how I play snooker, he decided that was the way you had to do it. Like, <laughs> it's just ridiculous that we've all done it for so long. You know, we've all gone along with it. Yeah. He must be laughing his head off somewhere. He, he's had it right off. No one's questioned it. Um, but in all seriousness, no. We only do that because he put it on paper first. He said, this is how you do it. Do it like this. He wrote the manual. Everybody goes by the textbook, yeah? So did you Absolutely. talk about, just, uh, just before we leave, say, right, did, did you talk about things like eye dominance and stuff like that there? I mean, uh, are, you, are, you, are you left or right-eyed? Do you know which eye? Do you have a strong eye? I, I, I'm slightly right-eye dominant, slightly. Right. And you're, you're right-handed. You're right yes. Yeah, you're right-handed, so you're right-eyed. Yeah. It's a big, big problem, you see, for players who are left-eye dominant like me. But sometimes yeah. if you have a weak right eye, 
you're not seeing the true angle, the true shot. Absolutely. I tell. Yeah, so I, I, I said to I said to Steve when we had a when 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 I when when we had our first session together, I I put on this uh, particular shot on the table that I was struggling with, mm-hmm. and um, he 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 watched me play the shot, and he said, "Okay," he said you know, implement the things that I've just shown you on the table, which I did. I hit, shot, hit the shot perfectly. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 you know, in golfing terms, this was the way I put it at the time. In golfing terms, when you're, when you're trying to get the ball around a golf course and you know, if you do miss, if I do miss the fairway, I know I'm only going to miss it on the left side or the right side. I, the worst possible thing is to stand there and not know where it's going to go. Mm-hmm. So in snooker terms, I I was standing up to play a shot. I didn't know if I was going to hit it thick, thin, or in the correct position. And what sight right gave me back was I knew if I was um, expecting to either pop the ball or miss it slightly thick or thin, it gave me back that sort of preconceived idea of you. So then I knew that the cue ball would follow the expected route. And I might get the safety shot or the shot to nothing or whatever it might be. Whereas I'd spent years playing shots where, you know, if I missed it, I could miss it anyway, could miss it thick, thin, anything you want. But with sight right, what it gave me was that I was always going to get the second part of the shot correct. Mm-hmm. No, very interesting point there. Thanks for sharing that with us, Sean. Lads. You know, the, this is one of the reasons why I get players at the top of Sean on here to talk about safe rate, because it's actually something I understand a little bit, and uh, I know why it's there. And I think you should watch and listen as much as possible. So hopefully you've listened to Sean. You know? Anyway, we want to touch on some questions here, Sean, because as usual, they're so exciting. But, the, you know, the time's just flying. Are you okay for time? You're enjoying this, by the way. I can tell. I can, you're absolutely loving this, by the way. You really are. <laughs> You know, I've been but, in lockdown for 10 weeks. I just like talking about snooze when I talk about snooze to somebody. It's fabulous. I know. I've been putting you off for weeks because there's lots of exciting players out there, you know, but <laughs> I didn't realize you were going to be this good. Oh, no. No idea. No. Anyway, looking back over your career, very simply, this is one of the questions as well. Uh, is there any part of the game you would have liked to have improved? I think uh, I think over the years I've played far too many shots, and Ray Reardon said this to me uh, maybe ten years ago, maybe eleven years ago, because my time with Ray Reardon wasn't as well publicised as Ronnie's was. Ronnie had him in his corner at the Crucible at a lot of events. Mm. I used to go and see Ray for a period of three or four years, and I used to go and see him two or three times a year, and we'd have a couple of days together, a bit of golf quite a lot of snooker, a bit of billiards. And it was just great to chat to him about things. And he said something to me, which I didn't really grasp at the time. And he said, Sean, he said, you play too many shots that could be your last. Hmm. And it didn't land. It didn't land. I was too young, a bit pig-headed, thought I knew better, you know, I'll stick with my game, Ray. Thanks very much. I'll play my way. This is how I go for sure. I'm going to go. If I'm going to lose, I'm going to go down fighting. You know, this is my strength. I've got to keep going for these shots. I've lost another match I shouldn't have done. Right. Now, now I've got to get back on the bike. Oh, I've done it again. Right. No, but it will he, It will work. It will work. Oh, crap. You know, it took me a long time to accept that, yeah, I play too many shots that could be my last. So, I've made that improvement over the last season or two where I've added a bit of a shot to nothing element to my strategy. Um, I play a lot more long pots now with the cue ball going back into a defensive position just in case. Whereas I've played all my life going completely for glory. You know, this ball has to go in. And if it does, I've got a chance. If I miss it, I lose. That's how I've played all my life. And I've just the last couple of years tried to just just tweak that a little bit, um, as have a lot of other players I've watched, um, and they've had success with that too. And so I suppose to answer the question, if I could go back in a time machine to you know day one, 
I would just take myself off the side and say, listen, don't do that. Do this. Do you watch yourself? You know, we talk about tweaks, we tweaks. Players, I always encourage young players, the kind of players that win my pro arms, you know, I always encourage them to, to have a look at their game. All right, they're not going to be on YouTube. A lot of the lower ranked professionals are going to be on YouTube. But you should really analyze your game a little bit more. Take a look at your the weaknesses. Know the weak areas of your game. Uh, so that, that's technical in one sense. This is different completely. Would you would you say that looking, you know, taking a look at the very weak parts of a, of, of a young amateur's, amateur's game is, is very, very important? Very, very important. And you never, you don't really understand your own game until you've seen it on camera. You don't. Yeah. You don't really understand how you, you know how how does your technique look? Is your backswing longer than you thought it was? Mm-hmm. Cool. I took a, I took a lot longer over that shot than it felt like. I you know I ran round the table faster there than I thought. I should have taken a bit more time. Should have been a bit more. You can't get that unless you watch it back. And it, I think it's important. You know, I watch all my matches back. Um, not from a narcissistic point of view. I don't like watching myself on TV. I don't like listening to myself spit. I don't like all of that. But I have to watch it back so I can see, right, you know, why did I play that shot like that at that time? Why did I do it? Mm-hmm. You know, when my opponent missed a shot unexpectedly, why did I jump out of my seat like a greyhound mm-hmm. and then rush to the table and make a mistake? What? What was that? Um, and you only get that from watching games back. Um, now, obviously, things have come on leaps and bounds in a very short space of time in terms of streaming, YouTube, mm-hmm. Facebook. You know, you, any match, whether it's on TV or not now, you can watch back somehow. Somebody's yeah. always uploading them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it's been a great service to all the players that have used it. And I think a lot more players do it than they say. No, interesting point. I think there you go, lads. So, if, you know, obviously, if you're not on YouTube, get yourselves a little uh, little video camera and just put it over the table. Have a, look, have a look at yourselves. Just play play for an hour. Or just, I mean, you know how difficult it is to put a camera and just in the corner and just have a look at yourself, you know? It's easy to do, isn't it? I mean, it's just very I think nice. it's one of those things. I think it's one of those things that we're all so used to watching snooker and being critical of it, with a you know watching it with a and just critiquing shot selection. Oh, I wouldn't have played that like that myself. Oh, I wouldn't have done that. But when you watch yourself, you'll be amazed at, at mm-hmm. what you see, and you say, "Oh my god, I didn't realize I did that," or "I didn't realize I played that like you know why did I do it like that?" And I think. I think there's a, a, a big resource there for players that goes untapped. Um, I don't know any young professional golfer um, or young amateur golfer that doesn't video themselves yeah. on the driving range, have mm-hmm. multiple cameras, you know, a swing coach, a this, a that, or the other. They're all into it. And I mm-hmm. think the younger players coming through in snooker, it's just a generational thing, I think. And I think, you know, in years to come, you'll see everyone at it. Well, I used to record my drives off the tee so that you have a good laugh, you know, yeah. share all over Facebook. <laughs> I, I was disgusted with them. Sure. Mean, isn't it? It's just mean. It's just oh, mean. Oh, goodness me. You know, there's it's, it's no need. There's absolutely no need for that at all. There's no need for it. No. Oh. Anyway, right, we're going to touch on uh, some questions here, okay? Because it's, as usual, it takes about an hour to get the questions because you're such an interesting chat to speak to. Very, very, very good stuff there, mate, on site right as well. Okay, let's have a little look here, see who's on. Um, bum, 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 bum. Everybody, everybody thinks you're very honest, Sean. You know? Very honest. They think you're very, very righteous and honest. You know, uh, it's Ben Hawkorn. A few ladies on here, don't like you very much. Oh, so I see suffering a lot down here. Too. Yes, oh yeah, he yeah, does. Yeah. Why do they have to do this? Why do you have to bring up haircuts? Nobody can go to the barbers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sean's allowed to have some long hair. All right, it's not oh, for that. I'm walking around here now. I'm walking around like the fifth beetle. It's ridiculous. Sean, I wouldn't do that for too long. 
There's no, something just going up there, and I'm not going to bring it up a bit later, but uh, things things are getting a wee bit thin up there, you know? What? You're joking. No, I'm, I, I, look, I'm speaking from experience. I was I was where you are when I was your age, and I'm a lot older than you, by the way. <laughs> you haven't got many haircuts left, eh? got to be honest. <laughs> right, Hang on a minute. Now, you got Lee Smith question for Sean. What percentage of natural ability will you will see you through the versus hard work? Did you get that? Yeah. Oh. Listen, I think you you know in a, in an ideal world, it's a bit like when people say, "Is it quite?" You know, we're talking about practice. Is it quality over quantity? Which which one's more important? And in a, in an ideal world, you'd have lots of both. Uh, in an absolute ideal world, you'd have a lot of talent and a lot of hard work. And and, and and usually those people are the ones that, you know, achieve legendary status. Um, they were very talented and they harnessed that talent with hour after hour after hour. Um, and then either side of that, you know, if that's like the middle lane on the motorway, they're the ones who do the best. And then either side of that, in either lane, you've got somebody with not quite as much talent, but a more work, bigger work, work ethic. And then the vice versa over here, somebody who, you know, has bags of talent, but, you know, doesn't quite work as hard. So, in an, as I say, in an ideal world, you'd have, you'd have equal amounts of both. I think if you could only have one, though, I'd always choose. So if I was picking a team, I'd always choose the hard worker. Mm. Over the person with more talent, because generally, generally, the one, the people with more talent, the real talented guys that don't work hard, they don't think they have to work hard, and that ends up tripping them up. Very natural, just like myself. It's okay. Anyway, by the way, it was Phil Seymour who made the comments about your hair. Do you know Phil? I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> anyway, Colin Phillips. You know Colin, don't you? I do. He's so dull. <laughs> Listen, this is your channel. I can't say anything. This is your channel. Colin wants to know what your favourite practice routine is and how does it, uh, how do you feel it works for you? And how it would benefit ours? Yeah, well, I think like my, 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 the, the things that I practice vary from, you know, day to day week to week depending on what i'm trying to improve on and um as i said earlier on what i've been working on recently in recent weeks months and maybe the last season is is trying to improve my consistency of striking that cue ball exactly where i want to that's mm -hmm. what i've been working on the most yeah i've been doing lineups and i've been doing tees and crosses and cue ball control things uh, and i'll come on to them in a moment because they've got their place but I think, you know, I've been doing a lot of work. Um, now, of course, people are going to assume this is a this is a sales pitch. It isn't. But I have been doing a lot of work with the product called the balls, which Chris Henry has designed, which are these ultra lightweight cue ball and object ball. Mm -hmm. Then, if you don't strike the cue ball exactly in the centre, the cue ball doesn't go in a straight line. Why? Interesting. And, and, and what's that talk? Now, it's very important to, to say from the outset, that doesn't mean you have to play every shot in the centre of the cue ball. That's not what, that's not what they're teaching. What, these, what the balls are teaching are, when you intend to strike the cue ball in the middle, can you? That's, what, that's, that's one of the things they teach. And, you know, one of the practice routines with this lightweight cue ball is you put the ball on the yellow spot and you have to pop that ball on its own into the what we call the number one pocket, which is the far left black pocket. And if you don't strike that cue ball, this lightweight cue ball exactly in the center, you can't pot it. it. Doesn't go anywhere near the pocket. It's hilarious. I haven't heard the of that. First one I, the first one I tried missed the pocket up the side cushion by about 18 inches. It was hilarious. And this is a, this is obviously testing your cue ball striking. Um, it, it has... But, you know, I've, I've spoken to some very old coaches in the past, Sean, and they've convinced me that nobody really ever hits that cue ball. Perfect. Nobody ever will 
uh, no. you'll get very close to hitting the dead center if you have to. If you have yeah. to hit the dead center. Nobody's ever going to hit it exactly precisely where you want to hit it, you know. But that's very, very interesting, actually, that, guys. Go on, get out there and sort that out, will you? Get out and hit those balls and make sure you put, put the right amount of sight on the ball as well. We've got here a question. How do you manage to such high level concentration? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Oh, by the way, uh, I'm getting some people here on here, Sean. All right, I know I, I know I look like Rick Harrison, you know, the Pawn Stars guy. I know I look like him, guys, okay? I don't have his money, but, it, 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 you know, he wants to come along and I can sell some stuff here online. You know, so what you have got. You've got a nicer cat than I've got. How about, oh, Chanel, I rescued her. She's a pain in the ass, mate. She's <laughs> sorry, honey. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, okay. Scratch me. Anyway, Aid Mitchell's got a question for you. How do you manage to keep such a high level of concentration during a session? Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's the, that's the thing we haven't talked about. You know, we talk about composure and technique. Well, the next one, it, or maybe even above them all, although composure for me is still at the top. You know, concentration, being in what, the now, thinking about what you're doing, not everything else. Uh -huh. is is just it's so important and i guess really as tied in linked with composure when you see a top player at anything underperform it has to be concentration when you see that player miss a miss a routine black off the spot you can be certain of one thing that they were not thinking about potting that ball into the pocket they can't be they're too good to think about it, to try and do it, and not do it. Interesting. When no. you see these routine, and I'm talking about routine mistakes, I'm talking about shots your nana could get. When you see the professionals miss those shots, they cannot possibly have been thinking about put that ball in the pocket and put the cue ball there. They can't be doing it. Because they're so good and they've practiced so much that if they did do that, it would go in the pocket and the cue ball would go over there. So the concentration element linked with technique and composure really is the, in my opinion, uh, is, the, is the secret to success. I've watched, as I said, I, I've been watching so much of the, the 80s and 90s. And the, when you watch Davis in his pomp in the 80s and Hendry, their concentrate, those two above everyone else. Yes, I mean, they both had better techniques than most. Uh, and they had a lot of other things going for them as well. But their concentration was out of this world. And it's something that doesn't get praised as much as it should. Their ability to focus on what they were trying to achieve for long periods of time is it's just mind-blowing it's very very difficult to do and it probably is one of the key reasons as why some days you'll see a player play to such a high level and then on another day they they won't they won't quite play to that level again and it's on those days where they can get taken by someone they can get beaten yeah uh, you know you talk about concentration too a lot of players a lot of young players who have just turned to tour you know who are really struggling there's a lot of them down there. So they're traveling to events. They're coming into a, they're coming into a, they're, they're traveling to different venues all the time. They're under pressure. Very hard for them to concentrate sometimes to focus because they're, they're, they're really struggling to get those first wins behind them to give them the very confidence. You know, but concentration can be very easily taken away from distraction. Is there anything that particularly distracts you? Yeah, you're, well, I, I, I mean, I, I, I have um, that phone's distracting me. Hang on. Throw it out the window. Throw it out the window. Yeah. I um, I have one of those minds that when I'm in a when I'm in the arena, there's a lot of things in a snooker arena that can possibly distract you, that can put you off. There's a lot of stuff in there to take your focus away. You're trying to laser beam onto this, and there's lots of things flying around. There's cameramen, there's the cameras themselves, there's the TV studio bubble that's in a lot of arenas these days, there's the photographers with the long lenses, then there's the crowd 
who, who they don't mean to put you off, but they've you know they've got the sweet wrappers, the old cliches of rustling their sweets or their crisps, fizzy drinks, phones, um, people's watches that still beep on the hour. I'm not sure who still wears one of those watches, but they all seem to come to the snooker. Um, uh, you know, it's we're talking about pandemics and everything that's going on. I think if NHS England want to take a they want to take the nation's temperature. They should come to a snooker tournament because you've <laughs> never seen so many people cough in a quiet moment as people seem to do at the snooker. Mm-hmm. Like if you go to the cinema, nobody coughs. Mm-hmm. You go to watch a play or something on the West End or the ballot or whatever you might, no one says, or nobody coughs. There's no, but it, like everyone seems to have a bad cough at the snooker and all of these things can put you off and distract you. But it is true. It is absolutely true that when you are in that zone, when you are in that tunnel zone, you you just don't see those things or you're kind of aware of them out there. But they, but you're, but you just don't let them into your zone. You don't let them in. And um, um, because I've got this, you know, it's not. I have. I don't have a photographic memory at, at all. But I, I, I will walk into a room and will. You know, I, I spot that and I spot that. That's out of place. That's the wrong colour. That should be over there. I, I have to work. I personally have to work very hard when I'm playing snooker That's to focus in on all of the. You know, get rid of all of those things. Turn the de- volume down on all of that stuff, and just play snooker. Well, I, I you know, that's that's uh, that is at your level. Look, when you're you're conscious of a lot of those noises and those things that are going on, I, I accept that. But the other thing, the one thing that I don't accept is that you know you, you take players that come to my competition to go to a club and playing on four tables where there's noise coming from the bar, we've got a background music, you know, yeah. something at the bar, chinging a glass or breaking wind or yeah. they're burping. You know, you, you know, your 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 player next to you is up your backside with a cue, you know, and yeah, yeah, yeah. What it is, you, you have to you have to adapt. You're supposed to be focusing on the bees, and you, yeah, you, but there's a big there's a big difference right. between there's a big difference between like the shootout. There's a big difference between concentrating at the shootout where everyone's making noise. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of things to distract you. Concentrating in that environment is fine. Yep. But concentrating in a silent environment and then being disturbed, that's different. It's it, it it's not trying to concentrate whilst there's noise. Concentrating playing snooker whilst there's noise going on is absolutely fine. Yeah, and no. God, God God forbid if all the tournaments were like the shootout. God forbid. But if they were, it'd be all the players would adapt to it. We'd all get on with it. Absolutely no problem. It's when you're it's when you're out there playing, and you're on your final backswing, and it's silent. And then somebody's phone goes off. That that's very very distracting. Um, I think I think you're just spoiled. You're just spoiled. Yeah. You're right up there at the top. You know, and you're right. looking at the wee boys, the wee boys in the practice rooms and the working men's clubs. You know, they're listening to all those noise. You're spoiled. You're a spoiled snooker player. Right. <laughs> By the way, Colin Phillips has come back on again. Can I ask you that question already? What's your favorite practice? Oh, I've asked you about have favorite practice routine. Oh. Pawn stars. Here we go again. What's with the pawn stars thing? <laughs> mm-hmm. I knew I'd seen that mustache somewhere before. Let me tell you. I knew it. I knew it. Just needs a little bit of uh, a little bit of dark for men. Darkness there. I'll take about ten. That's such a little tiny baby face. We're lucky. We're always going to look young, Sean, because we we have tiny faces. We're always going to look young. Yeah. Yeah. Women, women love me. They love my little nose and you know, little bald head and you know the chop. And honestly, I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you how far they go. They go far. You know, all the time. Let's see. Oh, Sean, the trigger finger. Oh, what's this? Uh, Del Boy, Del Boy. You know Del Boy. David Del Boy Church. He's asking about the trigger finger squeeze on delivery of grip hand. What's your opinion on that? So trigger finger squeeze on delivery. What is your uh, your take on that? Um, the grip as well. 
you're gonna you're gonna have to forgive me because you've used you've used a few words there together that I have absolutely no idea what you mean. Fair I don't right. know what that means. Trigger finger. Squeeze. I think I sort of half mentioned it earlier where you get people who are very technically involved thinking about as the queue goes back, they release one and then two and then three and which ones come back on in which order and at, yeah. does the queue stay connected to their chair. And I have to admit, that's just not the way I was taught. So I think um, Gary wants to go and do a bit of target shit. Well, no, I'm sure, I'm sure there are people out there who teach methods and, 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 you know, uh, get involved to that level. And, and maybe I should know more about that. But I was literally, you know, in terms of how to grip the queue, I was the, the way I was told was was actually out of a Joe Davis book, which was you put the queue on the table and you pick it up. And however you naturally, however it naturally sits in your hand, that's that's the grip for you. It, it you isn't what, really like the golf grip. In golf, you can have the overlap, the interlock, the baseball, you know, and you can, if you turn your hand slightly more like that, it affects. Snooker isn't quite like that. Obviously, you want to have a nice grip, loose. But mm -hmm. I, I would, I would, in my opinion, I would really stay away from going that deep into which finger, you know, reconnects at which stage, which is the trigger finger, and all of that. That that's for me. That's a bit. That's too deep. That's too involved. No, you're right, Del Boy. Get yourself up to Disney and uh, do a bit of target shooting, mate. Not all about trigger finger squeezing and breathing. Okay. I suppose breathing's got a little bit. Breathing, of br br breathing, 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 breathing's important. Breathing is important. Oh, so do you hold your breath, Sean? Do you like? <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, no, no. I, I, I'm in the camp. I think oxygen's a good thing. Um. I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a holder of breath. There have been players, and there are players who hold their breath on the on the shot. Um, but yeah, no, you're into you're into a realm. I can't go. I can't go well, with. Two, three. I can't do it. There's got to be a in there somewhere. It has to be. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I know he is. He's good. We all know you're good, Sean. You know, we have to keep reminding us how good he is. Sean keeps telling me how good he is all the time. And he wakes me up at two o'clock in the morning, begging me to come on the show. You know. <laughs> Not good. It wasn't quite two, was it? It wasn't uh, quite two o'clock. Well, you woke me up. Who's the best player ever? Okay, here's a question. This is straight out there. This is. I've stopped asking a lot of these types of questions, but uh, who's the best player ever? Is it Ronnie or is it Hendry? Or is it someone else? Yeah. I mean, is it, is it just to go off on a mad tangent for a minute, like you just ended there by saying, is it somebody else? Isn't it mad to think that out there somewhere, out there somewhere, like, you know, in a, you know, working with the cattle in Australia, there could be a farmer who's actually the most gifted Q sports person we've ever seen. He hasn't but he picked the queue up yet. But, but he he's just he's never been given it. No no one's ever given yeah. him a queue. He could exactly. be out there. She she could be out there. He or she could be out there somewhere. You know. Um I think it I think who's the greatest? It depends what you mean by the greatest. It depends on how people want to rank it. it. If it's on how many world championships Pete you've won, then it's Hendry. Uh certainly of the modern era. From you know, from the sixties onwards, if it's on world championships, it's Hendry. If it's on, I think you know, pound for pound, a player's player, you know what, you know when you what, then it's O'Sullivan by some distance because the things that he can do um, are mesmeric, are uh, just out of this world. When he's on, he's he's very close. He's not unbeatable, but he is very close to unbeatable when he's on. Uh, and his control and his shots and all of the things that go into it, you know, are fabulous. Um, I think technique. I think Steve Davis had the best technique. Um, if it's on total tournament wins, I think it's Hendry or it could be Davis. I'm not sure. Not sure who's got the most all-round tournament wins out of those two. Um Statistic. It depends how you want to grade it. In mm. terms of in terms of pure 
playing ability, it has to be Ronnie O'Sullivan. Has to be. I think so. I totally agree with that. As much as he gets on my nerves a bit. Shut the fuck up, Tyrus. Ben Hunter is good. Hello, Tyrus. I'm showing you the training balls. Oh, yes, we talked about the new training balls, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, somebody's just come on there, Stuart. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, by the way, guys, I'm just catching up with the questions because I like to get through them quickly. So we're going to let this man go to bed and give his baby a kiss. What do you see here? New training balls. Yeah, very good. So, yeah, Paul, get, get hold of those training balls, guys. I don't know how much they are. Sean, have you any idea how much these training balls are? I, I'm not sure. Uh, Chris uh, Chris does have a, an online uh, shop. Um I think it's on Chris Henry International or uh, some something like that. As I say, it wasn't a sales pitch. Otherwise, I'd have more details to hand. You know, Chris will kill me. Like, but um, they are they are a great training asset. Um, uh, they are fantastic. You know, to use uh, and you know they work as well. So uh, you know, there's 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 uh, a good reason to have them. You got another world championship in your show? Jeez, I mean that's the. That's the question, isn't it? I'd like to think so. Um, I really would like to think so. There have been some really dark, low moments in my career where I've just thought, no, that you know, that's that's it. Now I'm, I'm on a downward spiral. I'll never, um, I'll never play in another world final or another one table situation at the Crucible. Or you know, my time's come and gone. I had my three finals and I won one of them. But I, I think I was, you know, that was a year or two ago where I was, you know, a very low point in my career. Um, certainly the way the season was going um, I definitely would have gone to Sheffield very confident of having a really good run uh, and, I, and I really think that you know that the, the changes I have made to my game on and off the table um, hopefully will give me every chance of having some real long runs in that tournament you know over the next few years I don't know how many years I've got left. It's sort of at the top end of the game. Who knows? Um, but I'd, oh, I'd certainly like to think that I'll definitely have opportunities in the years to come. I'd like to think I've got a, another one in me. But who knows? It's my Canadian friend, a guy called James Parr. He came, he came all the way over to Canada just to play my pro arm. What a lovely guy. No, he didn't. He was seeing some family, you know. But anyway, he's got a question here. He's not a bad sticker player, actually. Uh, he wants to know, Sean, where do you put your right foot in relation to the line of aim? And uh, he wants to know about some of your routines as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, pre-sight right, I would have sight the ball before I get down to the shot, I would have stood there with my right foot on the line of aim and I would have walked into the shot as Joe Davis has taught us mm -hmm. since day dot. Yeah. Once you put sight right into your game, you cannot go back. And if you look at, if you look at pretty much every player who's been to Steve Feeney, whether they're still working with him or not, most of them still use those techniques. If you watch, if you know what you're looking for, you can actually see them still doing it. There's a, you know, I, I wouldn't name them by now. I wouldn't go through the list, but I would say a lot of them still, still would use those techniques. Um, so now when I sight the ball, I'm a little bit further over the line. I'm actually more, you know, the line of the shot would be more around my belt buckle. So I actually have to, cross the line now to play my shot I still I still get into the same position at address I'm still stood in the same place but I have arrived there in a different way because because it doesn't matter where your cue is in relation to your hip it's about what your eyes see so I now walk into the shot with my eyes on the line of the shot mm -hmm. not this fictitious area over here um, that Joe Davis decided it had to be. Uh, in terms of practice routines, you know, I would do all the practice routines that everybody does, the lineups, the T-shapes, the X, uh, averages, long pots, uh, working with the Chris Henry um, balls, as I've already mentioned, rest play, 
working it, do it. You know, it's nice to play the odd little shot with the spider just so you get the feel. Because who knows that that shot to win your local handicap tournament or the club championship or the world championship might be with the spider. It might be with the swan neck. Mm-hmm. When was the last time anyone practiced with the swan? What happens if the shot to win the tour championships is with the swan? Like, you know, who's, you know, that, that's the equivalent to a golfer not practicing out of a bunker. You know, that's, that's, it doesn't make any sense. So it's important, I think, to run through all of these shots. The biggest thing I practice now these days is my concentration. So, Instead of instead of going for an extremely difficult routine and trying to complete it, what I now do is go for a more basic routine that I know I should complete. Mm-hmm. And then I make myself complete it for either a given amount of time or a set amount of you know repeats. So if I'm doing the lineup, I used to do the lineup. I had to take each red in individual order or I had to play each red with a black or a pink or from a certain side of the tech or one of those other things. I don't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Now what I do is I do the lineup and I, I do it for an hour. Wow. And if I miss, that's, I have to stop. And I have to stop. Yeah. Uh, if I, if I miss, I have to stop and start again. The target yeah. is to do it for an hour. Can you con? you know, you should do it. Mm-hmm. What you're practicing is to concentrate for that period of time. That's what I'm practicing. Um, when I was 12, I got the opportunity to go and practice with Steve Davis. And my, my father and I arrived at his club before he got there. And his dad was there, old Bill Davis. And everyone's heard the stories about Bill Davis. And, you know, he, he, he coached one of the greatest players that's ever lived. And my dad asked Steve's dad, Bill, like, obviously, this was in 94, so Steve was just starting to just dip a little. They said, like, you've achieved everything in the game. You are. When you come to practice, what do you practice? And mm-hmm. Bill gave the game away straight away. He said, when we practice now, we practice concentration. And if only, if only I'd taken that on board a little bit more. But at, at 12, 13, 14, 25, 30, you don't take these things on board. You don't. You don't yeah. take it in. So, mm-hmm. you know, there are, I would be practicing little technical things. I'm always working on my action. As I say, hitting that cue ball where intended is vital. But the biggest thing I'm practicing now is the concentration. Quick fire questions here. These are the standard ones to get. Best of sevens or best of nines? Best of nines. Easy one. It's a no-brainer, really, is it? Oh. I'm embarrassed. For, I'm embarrassed for you that you asked me it. To be honest. Oh, why? Well, it was just such an easy <laughs> question, wasn't it? I have to ask. Do you know why I have to ask? Because we play best of sevens, and yes. I don't know why that is. I know why they're playing best of sevens. I'm not going to get into it, but everybody prefers best of nines. But anyway, mm-hmm. we'll leave it at that. Well, all the that players way. prefer best of nines. Of course, they do. Right, this is a question from Steve Martin. Steve, Steve's played a couple of my pro arms a couple of years ago. Very good soccer player, actually, Steve. I want to get you back to the club soon, mate. Anyway, he's, he's got a question for you, Sean. Uh, what would you do to improve the grassroots of snooker in the UK? Uh, well, I, 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 a few years ago, um, you know, there was a group of us got together and we really wanted to try and revolutionise the amateur body, uh, the EASB in in uh, in England, and we wanted to feed that into the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was talk of we were trying to not disband the NGBs, but we wanted them to merge and we wanted them to work together because there's a, there's quite a lot of uh, we want to be bigger than you and uh, we're a bit older than you and. Uh, you know, there's a bit of that amongst all national governing bodies, not just in the UK. And I really thought there was an opportunity there a few years ago um, with Snooker Backer, who runs a lot, used to run a lot of tournaments. Yeah, right. Very well thought of, yeah. um, you know, amongst the amateurs and, and, and uh, you know, everyone that knows him. And I really thought there was an opportunity there for him to get involved and merge 
his extremely successful amateur tour mm-hmm. with an NGB or set up a new national governing body mm-hmm. uh, and let him run it. Just like, because you're, you're very good at that, do mm-hmm. it and everyone will come. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, guys, it's not often you get a top professional soccer player actually you know, talking, about it, talking about the problems in the amateur game. Um, Sean, you just hit it on the head. You know, because the, the amateur game in my view is in a bit of a mess at the moment. I had a debate on it, by the way. It's on YouTube. You can take a look at it when you get bored. But uh, a lot of players were talking about where they are in the amateur game and talking about the problems with the format of the, uh, the Challenge Tour. You know, slightly different changes they could make it to make it a, an interesting, maybe a, a more opportune event. Uh, or they could possibly maybe open it up a little bit, you know, or... Or other ideas like scrapping Q school and creating an amateur tour where you had a, a fast turnover of players coming on and off the tour, which is not a bad idea, actually, but uh, it's very hard to take all I think this. what I can say, if I could just make this point before we move oh. on, for everyone watching, just to make this point, the Players' Commission, hmm. which is you know quite a recent addition to the professional game, uh, and obviously since Barry Hearn got involved, World Snooker Limited, now World Snooker Tour and WPBSA have separated. They are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. I can assure people out there that these entities are aware of and are trying to solve and fix the problems of the amateur game. Mm -hmm. uh, Far and wide, not just uh, with the UK. WPBSA created the WSF, the World Snooker Federation. And with the sole purpose of trying to bring these things together and make it better. Before anyone starts saying about scrapping Challenge Tour, scrapping Q School, let's do this, do that. People should remember these things didn't exist until that long ago. That's true. And, and people have been crying out for playing opportunities. They, oh. they do have, they could be better. Um, there's absolutely no question about that. Challenge Tour could be better. Q school could be there could be more cards there could be a, a quicker turnover um it isn't perfect but it, yeah. it is it is a work in progress anyway i'm available quarter of a million pound a year all right just ring me barry hearn rings me all the time ring you. Right there. i'm sick i'm sick of talking to him all the time you know i just keep hanging up on him a quarter of a million you'd be willing to take a pay cut would you don't start on me sean I'm worth every penny. I'm worth every <laughs> penny. Right, we got. Uh, we're going to wind this down very shortly, just in case you're getting a bit concerned. Okay. Uh, Dave Morgan's asking you uh, who do you admire most on the tour and why? Yeah, I think I think uh, I think when you look at people, you know, I admire Ronnie. I admire his longevity. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a massive respect for, you know, what he's achieved and, 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 and just what he's able to do. And regardless mm-hmm. of what gets said, you know, he, he, he grafts, he puts the time in, he works on his game. Um, so I have a lot of admiration for him and I have a lot of admiration for the staff, you know, people who don't get mentioned. I have a lot of admiration for the backroom people, the people who put these events on, the people who, without these people who, rig the venues who put the sets out who you know facilitate these events going on yes they're all paid of course they're paid and they're in positions but without them these this these events wouldn't happen and and they never really get the praise they deserve the minute the minute the final is over and everyone else is out celebrating they're in working and they might join the party two or three hours later but they deserve a lot of credit as well just touching on tables, cues, tips and chalk. What cue have you got? What kind of tips you got on there? What kind of chalk you play with? What's your situation? Yeah, I um, I use a John Paris uh, Ultimate cue that was sort of made as a, a replica-ish of, of a cue that I had since I was 15. The cue that I won the world title with um, was actually a very old cue and had quite a long history. Um, and it started to fray at the very top end. So I got the thought of, well, I can chop it. But the queue had quite a, as I say, it had quite an interesting history. I think Ray Reardon had used it at one point. It had been used by a lot of different people over the years. So the thoughts of taking a knife to it 
uh, turned me off. So I ended up I ended up giving that to a friend um, who'd helped me out a lot throughout my career. And I just said to John Parrish, you know, would you make me a cue? He made me a few, and um, this this one that I use is is now the one that I've I've had now for yeah, it must be getting on for seven or eight years now, something like that. Um, you know, it's it's half an inch shorter than snakes, it's fifty seven and a half inch long. It's nine. It's a it's a nine nine millimeter tip, um, and I've tried all sorts of tips over the years. Um, I really like a lot of the tips out there. It's one of you know the tip market has really opened up. You know, there's it used to be my day. It was blue diamond or Oakmaster. Now there's you know it could be a hundred different types. I, I still uh, still am a very sort of traditional tip user. I use a very traditional Elkmaster out of the box and and, and straight on. Uh, in chalk, I use the latest edition of Towham, the Towham 2.0, the gold. I think it's the oh, one in the gold wrapper. It's the gold. Gold. Um, Yeah, I like it. Um, I think in terms of kicks and uh, big bounces off cushions, um, nobody, you know, a few years ago, I went on a bit of a mission on Twitter and I said, I'm going to find the reason for kicks. I'm going to work it out. And we found what the reason was very early. It was friction. Any amount of an increase in friction between the two balls colliding was a kick. But nobody ever gave credit to what caused the friction. The chalk was staring at us in the face all along and no one thought to look at it. Everyone went, including myself, was like, oh, is, it, is it the oil in the cloth that when heated, it's eroding the surface of the ball and all this? Now, that, that was happening. Uh, is it the lights? Is it static? Is it this? Is it? It was the chalk. <laughs> it was the chalk. You know, I think there's tiny wee demons out there dancing around the table, getting in between the shots. You know, like you know, you know I, that's some of, some I've of, been and looked. I have looked. I have to be honest. I have you know looked. I mean, there are no oh, demons oh, present. They're just kicking up a bit of dust. You know, yeah. and it, boom. That's it. You're gone. You know, I don't know. Nobody thought to nobody thought to look at the chalk, and I, as well as anyone, was uh, I'm very surprised by how much of a difference that chalk has made. It's not kick free. We're not living in a kick-free world yet, but we're living in a vastly reduced, um, problematic world. Certainly, as far as kicks are concerned, anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. not on the news, but it should. It's not on Sky News, but it should oh, be. Should be. <laughs> it should be on Sky News. That's how important it is. All right. Uh, breaking okay. news. Breaking news coming in from our snooker correspondent. <laughs> Shut it down. Right, we're just going to wrap this up very shortly, Sean. Right, look, we've got 128 professionals on the tour, okay? Yeah. Because vastly improved, a lot more competitions, a lot more money because of Barry Hearn, obviously. A lot of sponsorship, a lot of Chinese money too. Very good, fantastic. Better than it was years ago. Maybe back in the days, maybe players my age came in where you had maybe 700 regist registered professionals going to Blackpool, getting through the qualifiers. It's certainly not as bad as those days. But we got 120 professional sticker players, Sean, okay? And quite frankly, mate, uh, about a third of them are struggling to make a living. Mm. What does that tell us? Does that tell us that there's too many? Maybe not. Does that tell us that the format's wrong? Uh, should it be seeded a little bit? What's your view on that? Well, I, I mean, I, I've been quite vocal about this over the years. I wrote a document about this when I was on the board of WPBSA, um, and I wrote a piece on it on my website, uh, which, I, you know, to my discredit, I haven't updated in some time, but it's on there. Um, I, I wrote a piece about this, which, I, I, in my opinion, if it were up to me, there would be less players on the tour. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are too many players on the tour. When you achieve your status as a main tour professional snooker player, your days of qualification should be over, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yep, it really should be, as a snooker player, it should be the luck of honey. It should be opportunities for everybody. It should be, it should be exactly what you think it is. Um, I think the numbers... When you look at the qualifying structures and how and how 
many tables there are at qualifying venues and how hard it is to set up. I just think there's a massive glaring beacon in the room. No one, it's like the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about it. There are too many players on the tour. Mm -hmm. um, again, completely in my opinion, uh, it's not that it's not that people don't deserve it. It's not that they don't deserve the opportunity. Of course they do. Everyone has worked hard and earned that opportunity. But there simply isn't the money in the game yet yeah. to spread from the top to the bottom. Um, where, as you say, you know, there, there's, there's, a, there's a good group of guys down towards the end of the rankings who will have been struggling, certainly through this pandemic, where they're not mm -hmm. earning any money and there's no scope to earn any money at all. Um, and I should think there's probably more than that, quite frankly. Um, yeah. But in, certainly, as I say, once when you, when you hold that tour card in your hand, in my opinion, it should open up a, a whole new world. So my proposal was to cut the tour in half, 64 players, mm. and everybody else goes on the Challenge Tour. Qualify. Open it up. Everyone That's goes great. on the Challenge Tour. And, well, yeah. and I was, you know, nobody gets a tour card to the main tour without yeah. going through Challenge Tour. There are no there are no tickets from anyone around the world, the Australians, the Africans, the Indi No, Nobody anywhere gets a tour card to the main tour without going through Q School or Challenge Tour first. That's how I would have it. Uh, yeah. And when you get to that main tour, it should be no qualifiers. Mm. Everyone in at the first round in every tournament, including the World Championships. I still think it's ridiculous that our biggest event, everyone doesn't start in round one. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't understand it. I think I'm on my own, uh, certainly as a top 16 player, to say mm -hmm. that. I'm sure everyone wants to be seeded as far through as they possibly can. Yeah. But, it, it, you know, it just, for me, it doesn't make any sense. Now, I'm sure there are commercial reasons, and that's for WST to work out. And mm. they are probably the overriding factors in all of this. But in, if it were up to me, it would be a 64-person tour, uh, and everyone else would be on Challenge Tour. They'd both be better funded, more money, and... I think it would be, you know, a lot bright, a lot more brighter proposition for everybody. Absolutely, totally agree. You're the only professional sticker player that's actually agreed with me on that, uh, or I agree with you on that. Whatever way you want to look at it, Sean. I look for, for me. I look at the figures. I look at their earnings. If I see, if I see uh, forty, fifty players, forty odd players on the tour who are making nothing, not even covering their costs, then that for me that's a problem. Mm. That's a problem. So it's not just about uh, in, in terms of uh, do they have the ability to go further. That tells me there's too many players on the tour. That mm. tells me that perhaps maybe 60, there should, should be a professional 60, 64 player format and then perhaps another 128 players qualifying to reach that first round. Yeah. And there's other ways of doing that. There really isn't an awful lot where I don't think there's a lot wrong with the challenge tour. The challenge tour just needs to be slightly modified, you know, maybe yeah. S the sevens. Maybe instead of the order of merit, extend the order of merit, bring it out, open it up. I mean, World Stuka could even bring in more revenue, you know, that way. And, and and so I mean if they open it up and play them through the years, and all of a sudden the amateur game uh it's got a whole new meaning. You know, it has a purpose. Because the players could possibly, as amateurs, they could possibly get involved in a ranking event. Yeah. So I think your views on that are quite similar. You know, fantastic. Right now, Sean, we're going to finish off, okay, with one more thing. We've got to talk about the World Championship this year, okay? Yeah. It looks like it looks like it's going to be played behind closed doors. Yeah. Well, so, um, I'll just mention testing before I get your response to this. I'll just mention. I think testing is going to be a part of this, uh, COVID testing, maybe antibody testing as well, because they're rolling them out now uh, mm. in the next two, three weeks, forever mm. for people. And I think we should be looking at that from a professional sports perspective as well. So what are your views on that, the World Championship played behind closed doors? And 
what areas do you think we should do? What, what, what things do you think we should do in order to make it uh, to make it safe? Well, I can tell you that uh, for the newly announced Championship League that starts on June the first, um, yeah. testing is mandatory. Um, uh, so that's already in place and right. will be in place going forward. Um, that was communicated to us earlier this week by World Snooker. Um, uh, the Championship League as well, which I'm not in, uh, but a lot of the guys are, um, is going ahead. But, you know, as well, there's a hotel on site. Once you get there to play, you're not allowed out. You're in the hotel. You know, you're you're kind of quarantined, but, but you're not quarantined. Um, mm. uh, but, you, you know, once you're there, you're there till you finish playing. Everyone's tested. Uh, mm. And, you know, obviously all measures are in place. I think each player is going to have their own... Um, you know, uh, very cleaned and sanitised equipment to use. They'll all have their own rests, uh, spiders and extensions. You won't be using the communal ones at the end of the tables anymore. Obviously, there'll be no handshaking or any 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 contact of that kind. But snooker, you know, snooker does lend itself to a life behind closed doors. Um, it was always marketed as the ultimate TV sport. When, mm. when Sir David Attenborough commissioned Pop Black back in the 60s, 70s, mm. you were there. I, don't, I wasn't there. But, you know, um, I, you know it, it was always the ideal colour TV sport. So I don't think there's any problem with that. Um, it's, of course, of course, it goes without saying that we as players want as many people to be there as poss uh, as we could possibly get. The thoughts of walking out at the Crucible Theatre to nobody is, is, is horrendous. It's almost unthinkable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Rob Walker or whoever the MC is announces you out and you walk out and there's nobody there. It, it, it's it's going... Worse. Could be a lot worse, you know. I mean, there, 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 there are... All right, you've got football, football games where you have maybe... You know, <clears throat> anything between thirty and fifty thousand people. You know, in a in a snooker arena, you have several thousand people. But mm. a lot of it, a lot of it, really, is Eurosport, ITV, mm. BBC. So, I mean, you, you could say that it's not the end of the world. In no, well, I, I mean, snooker. You know, mm. snooker isn't driven. Obviously, the the ticket sales income for World Snooker is significant, but it isn't the most significant part of their income. It's not like the turnstiles at Man United every week, where there's seventy five thousand people through the gate, and and that that represents a significant part of their turnover. I don't think the ticket sales for these snooker events are that important to World Snooker. The actual numbers themselves, the crowds, the people, they make the game what it is, and you know without the fans sport dies that, mm -hmm. that that's a fact um but but we are very lucky that our sport as i say lends itself to tv it lends itself to streaming uh, it lends itself to these guidelines that are becoming our way for the foreseeable future mm -hmm. the most important factor of this which i haven't heard a lot of people talk about it has been talked about but not by a lot is that the world championships has to be played because there are people on the ranking lists fighting for their tour spots, fighting for their tour cards, fighting for their livelihoods. Will they be pros next year or won't they? Will they be relegated to the Challenge Tour? Will that be on? Where's Q School? All of these things have to be answered. But the first thing has to happen is that the season has to be completed. The World Championships, in my opinion, has to go ahead. And if it has to go ahead behind closed doors in a very surreal environment, someone's going to pick that trophy up to nobody. Mm -hmm. But that's a very it. small price to pay because the, the, the domino effect after that, the season completes, people are relegated, people are promoted, and off we go into the future. That has to happen for the game and everyone associated with it to move on. Um so, listen, it would never be my choice, but if we have to play behind closed doors, then so be it. Yeah. I'll tell you, you know, obviously, 
we're 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 all getting through this pandemic pandemic very very well. I mean we're 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 all trying to get through it, and like a, like a, a lot of other professional sports people, I think I think we're going to come back to our sports. There's going to be a lot of top professional snooker players, a lot of snooker players in general are going to come back into the sport. And I, I think they're going to come back with a whole new type of enthusiasm. You know, right. we've made this, we've got through this, we've probably lost some people or we, we know of some people who have lost, you know, lost uh, lost their lives to the virus. But I, I think this is just going to make us all stronger. You know, and I just I, think I, it, I think, I think it, I think this will put, it, this will put, I think snooker is the same as a lot of other sports, if I'm completely, there's a lot of moaning goes on. You know, there's a lot of moaning about things that don't matter. Like golf must be the same. Tennis must be the same. Every working environment must be the same. Yeah. But I think what we've all gone through in the last months and are still going through, mm-hmm. I think we'll put all of that into perspective for everybody. When we do return to whatever normal looks like in the coming weeks and months, mm-hmm. I think we'll go back to it with a renewed sense of perspective. And a, and a renewed appreciation for the freedoms to go to the snooker club or go to a snooker tournament or the cinema or what, whatever it might be that we've all had forever and that have been taken away from us. That's going to happen. It will pass. Um, and we will, we, we will all, have, all have learned a bit of humility and a bit of um, respect for these things and the frontline workers and everyone out there looking after us. I think we'll have a, a newfound appreciation um, for things. But, you know, it's been horrible. I mean, personally, like, you know, I, I, I don't know anyone or the, like my, we haven't lost anyone in the family or know anyone who's gone to the, the virus. But there have been, there was, you know, one significant friend of my family, been a, you know, would have, he would have known me since I was two or three years of age. He was a close friend to my parents. Uh, our families were all quite tight. And he passed away from another illness very suddenly, unexpectedly. He used to come to a lot of my tournaments. We were very close. And he passed away uh, six weeks ago now. Mm-hmm. And to think that that's happened and, I, you know, I was never able to get to him, uh, could never say goodbye, couldn't go to the funeral, as have lots of people been through that this, themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, Six months ago, if someone had said that to us, it would have been unthinkable. Um, so I think for us, I think for us to have all gone through that, we all know somebody who's been affected by it, if not directly. When when we all return to snooker or whatever our passion might be, I'd say we'll all go back with a new a new felt you know feeling of appreciation and um, perspective. Sure, I can't think of a better way to end this. <clears throat> But thanks very much for joining us. And uh, You're welcome. it's a pleasure to have you on, mate. Thank and, you. Uh, covered lots of areas here. Boys, we've covered lots of areas. You know, we've got inside, we've got inside the head of Sean Murphy, just like I promised you we would. We did. <laughs> it's a we, worrying place. It's a scary place. <laughs> you know, he's a little bit confused, just like the rest of it. We're all <laughs> you know, look what he's just done to his hair. I mean, I know, look, look. Get a haircut. Why don't you <laughs> still bring the clippers and do what I do? What's wrong with this oh, she oh. loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, look, Sean, <laughs> we'll give you a tank. I want to talk to you about something that's coming up in the coming months. Okay, don't be back. Not to worry about. I'm putting you first this time. I'm not leaving you last. But thanks very much for joining us, mate. Okay? Welcome. Thanks. Take it easy. Stay safe. Take care. I'll speak to you soon. Okay, let's get rid of him before he comes back on again. <laughs> right, guys, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm getting a bit tired. This was only supposed to go on for about an hour with Sean because he's got two wee children and, uh, you know, they're, they're driving him mad and he's driving them mad. And, uh, you know, Lady Chanel is over there. She's just, hey, darling, how are you? Are you all right? It's okay. So what we're going to do, guys, uh, I'm going to organize something next week, uh, through the week. Um, I'm going to talk to uh, some club owners, okay? I'm going to get a bunch of club owners on. They're going to pop on -on one-on-one, maybe about half a dozen of them, 
maybe a few more. And we're going to talk about where the game's going in terms of the clubs. And we're going to talk about ways that the clubs should promote themselves within within the game. And we're going to talk about um, pretty much what's going to happen when we get out of the lockdown, things get back to normal. And we're going to talk about getting young players back into the game again, something that we're missing from the game. I grew up in days where we didn't have mobile phones. You know, we only had four TV channels, no social media. So it was a fascinating thing for a wee boy at the age of 10 to walk into a working men's club and see see this big, big green snooker table. What is that, Daddy? What does that thing do? How is that? What do you, what, you know, that's a fascinating thing. Kids don't do that anymore. Kids walk into a snooker club with a mobile phone and, you know, a video game and they're looking at themselves and sending pictures of their boyfriends and their girlfriends and, you know, it's just all messed up. So you want to get these kids back into the clubs. We want to create, you know, make snooker what it should be. So I want to get some club owners to join me through the week. Wednesday evening, I'm going to get in touch with a few. And then we're going to get them. We're going to talk about some very important things. Thanks very much for joining us, lads. I will put up the posters for the next event. And uh, I'm not sure who we're going to be speaking to next Sunday. I'm just waiting for them to come back. You know, terrible snooker players are terrible to get a hold of. You know? But anyway, stay safe.